Hey guys, what's going on? It's your favorite NRL fantasy fanatic coming at you with round number four fantasy analysis from my very own bedroom with my very own team. Currently ranked, well, we've actually dropped back a couple of ranks to 3,340. Last round, we were 500th, 575th, or something around those marks. Before that, we were 22nd. So we've slipped through the cracks. We're starting to fall back a little bit. This round's really important to kind of regather that, guys. But you know what, if you're enjoying the series thus far and you want to keep up and track with these videos which I'm releasing every Wednesday for you guys, my team is a complete open book so you guys can see it. I can talk you through why I'm doing certain things or I can answer certain questions about, you know, do I want to trade out Kuro Sirenin because he seems to have not lived up to his hype. Be sure to subscribe, hit that subscribe button, give the video down below a like and be sure to keep asking me your questions. Any of those questions you ask on YouTube, or in any of the fantasy forums I'm on, or any of the fantasy groups I'm on. I'm going to do a video about the social media side of fantasy next week. I know I keep saying that in the prior weeks, but I'm actually definitely going to be doing it next week. This week, the theme is, should I buy the NRL Fantasy Coach? It's like an extra 20 bucks. You can buy $4 will get you one month of uh, Fantasy Coach. 20 bucks will get you the entire season, and you can start off with a two-week trial. And I thought... I may as well show you, show you guys what the NRL Fantasy Coach payment does for you and is it worth it so you can make your own determination and what are the benefits, what are the key advantages. Are the guys who have got access to the NRL Fantasy stats, the additional stats, going to be that much ahead of you? And the answer is, mm, maybe. But before we get into it, let's have a quick look at my team. Cameron McInnes did the job for us. He got 61 and I'm, I'm happy to say I actually captained the highest scoring player on my team. McInnes, he played the 80 minutes. He looks to be an 80-minute hooker for the rest of the season, which is good news for us. Case of Pritchard went off about the 62nd minute after an ankle injury, and he might be out for the following round, but I think it might only be out for one round. So I'm happy to hold him. Felice Kafusi just keeps going from strength to strength. I think he got 43, 43, then 45, and has gone up a total of 78K. James Graham's doing the job, of course. I know a few people are saying he's underperforming, but... I mean, he's averaging 52 at the moment. What more do you want from a guy who's just a bulldozer? Matagi, Musgrove. Musgrove is on the chopping block for me. Joshy McGuire got out of 70, uh, 41. A few people are a bit, you know, upset after they traded him after the last round and thought, well, he's going to be scoring 50s, 60s and whatever, but he scored a 41, which is a little bit down from his usual average. Sammy Burgess finally go, got over the 50s and got into 56. Jack DeBell in a 60. Winnerstein and Surinan got 19 and 30. Yates of 43. Kane Elgi and Riley Jacks did the job for me because Norman and Cartwright were both out. So my two gun hook, my two gun halves were both out. So that was a big shame. So I'm, I'm definitely going to be improving in that position at least for the following week. Sully, mm, you know, he was up against Lapana, and uh, which is uh, Jordan Rapana and, and uh, Joey Leilua. And that's always going to be a big, you know, a big, you know, probably the most devastating combination to be facing. Uh, to be honest, so I'm not surprised that he went down a little bit there. Shoney Mattaldi had a jaw injury and went off and only got 29, which is, you know, it's still a decent score for in the centers. Kelly 16, Talakai is back this week, Abby 16, Tyron Roberts Davis. Uh, it was a little bit disappointing considering he was supposed to be on the wing, and that's where Tyler Cornish scored his try, so we got a, a try and also a line break. And had um, Roberts been able to get that instead of um, Tyler Cornish, he would have been up there in the 20s. Anyway, Kotrick lived up to his name a little bit there in this round, being outside Jared Croker and got set up with a very gifted try at some stage. And uh, we've got Roger Torvastashek who's going to be back, and Braden Burns who got a one-week suspension, which is a huge shame because the reason why he doesn't score many points is because he's outside Heimel Hunt. Hummel Hunt does not like to offload the ball. For whatever reason, it was just really, really stressful to watch as a Braden Burns owner because you're like, you're just waiting for Burns to explode and get that outside power and get that speed down. But it was never the case for him. And unfortunately, the, the Rabbitohs have had to like completely move their team around with Sutton's gone back into the halves. And then Walker's gone to fullback. Johnson's gone to uh, the wings. So expect him back next week. But let's have a look at the fantasy stats. Let's have a look at the actual stats. What the actual fantasy twenty dollars? I don't have the little ad. Usually, if you haven't paid paid for fantasy coach, comes up on the right hand side. So let's have a look at the stats, what you get for it, and what it kind of does, and what you should be looking for. So right here, when you go to the stats center, the normal stats is there. But when you click fantasy stats, the first thing that you'll see is your break even. So that's what everyone refers to as their BE. So break even is when you're doing a projected score, whenever you score amount of points, what is the break even? So if the break even was say 20 and your player scored 30, 
then they're going to be you know getting a much higher value for the next round their cash asset value is going to be going up how much it's going to go up is is depending upon how much they beat that necessarily break even so that's one thing to consider so the stats come in if a high scoring if a high if a player of very high value starts to score very low like for example an Elliot Whitehead who's been pushed into the centers his break even is just going to keep going higher and higher while his dollar value continues to go down until it naturally balances itself out to where he should be scoring in the new average that he's been scoring so it's a pretty good tool to to use at some point because you want to be able to understand who's going to make you a lot of cash there's going to be a couple of rounds in there where you want to trade in some quick cashies to make you know possibly 20 to 50 to 60k in the next three to four rounds and that's going to be dependent upon the guys who have negative break evens or very low break evens for example a Bryce current run has a break even of 81 it's the highest one of this round coming up which means he's probably not going to score 81 in the second row for the Panthers this weekend so he's not going to be valued at $433,000 he's going to be going down what you want to be able to do, guys, is you want to be able to effectively buy when they're low and sell when they're at their peak. And the break-even pretty much tells you the story as much as the averages do um, when you're doing that. Let's have a look at the other side of the spectrum, the negative break-evens, the one at the lowest. Dylan Ed- Ed- Edwards is a good sit- is a good case. 5% of fantasy coaches out there own him. A lot of people are trading him. I warned people two rounds ago that he's probably only going to be playing one round because Peter Hiku and DWZ were coming back. They came back. Guess what? He played one round. Yes, he made $28,000 and then didn't play. So this break even is going to stay at negative 10 for the rounds to come until he plays another round. He might not play another round. You've got to remember, Joshi Mansour comes back in about seven rounds or so about now, around 13, 11, 12-ish. So... His playing days might be up for the first division team, and therefore, if you've got him, it's a bit of a waste to be holding him onto anything. Jaden Braley, I've got to give applause to you guys who held Jaden Braley, because I had him, and then I moved him to Casa Pritchard during the first live round. So it wasn't considered a trade, it was just considered a straight swap, because I was worried that the news on Seguiaro coming back was going to ultimately affect his minutes, or potentially push him out of the squad. And as you can see now, Segi's just been named, so... There's still a lot of question marks about will he be playing the majority of the minutes? He's been named on the extended bench number 20. Will he come up into the top 17? Will he be able to, you know, what does that mean for Braley owners? Braley owners, don't be too concerned. You're on negative six break even. If he does get named in the 17 with Seguiaro, I wouldn't be reserving Jaden Braley. I'd be reserving other players if you've got any other guys who are going to be scoring much higher. So the fact is I wouldn't be trading out Braley just yet because he's got negative six break even. He's definitely going to be getting more money. He's going to be getting his money's worth. And one thing to note is if you do own Case of Pritchard, you'd be surprised to know that Case of Pritchard is now 223000 as well as Jaden Braley. So they, Jaden Braley owners have actually claimed, you know, gained about 50 more K than Case of Pritchard owners. Not to mention that uh, Case might not even play this week. Luke Yates, Kurt Capewell. I'm surprised by Capewell's success given the fact that he's playing in the centers, yet he's a second row. So he might get dual position. After he plays four rounds in the centers, they will dub and say, look, he's an official center. Here's the second row and also center status. So you can play him in either position, which is quite handy, especially if you've got someone like Shoni Matadi who can swap him around if he does get injured out. Riley Jacks is there, Carl Lawton, Kotrick. The whole idea here is, guys, is if, you, if you're looking at cashies, who, who's going to make me the most amount of dough? Do I have these players? You want to have a lot of these guys rather than have a lot of those guys. The other thing is, don't be scared about break-evens as well. I've got Bryce, he can't write. He's um, definitely going to lose cash. But do I want to trade him out, then trade someone else in? And the answer is no. I don't believe in uh, trading a gun for anything. If I think Bryce Cartwright at the end of 26 rounds is going to be in the top 25 scorers overall, I'm going to hold on to him. And I still think that's going to be the case. It's a good situation if you're looking to pick up Bryce Cartwright in a round or two when he starts, you know, starts to bottom out. So when he when he scores the next round, whatever his predicted amount is, let's have a look. Does it tell us the fantasy coach? There you go. So if he scores 40, he goes down $31,000. And then his break even then goes back to 44, which, you know, will be a good plateau for him to start to, you know, equal out a little bit there. So after the next round, he's going to lose the bulk amount of his cash. 
because effectively he's played, you know, those wondrous four rounds. So I'd be looking at bringing him in. If you're looking at bringing him in, there's other options we're going to be looking at. But let's just focus on the stats. So there's, there's the break-evens. Venue analysis. I don't like venue analysis. It's telling us who scores the best averages at particular venues. So, for example, Jamal Idris. He's playing at ANZ round 5. He scores 32. In round 6, he's going to be playing the Cowboys at, you know, one three hundred smiles, whatever the stadium's called. He doesn't have any stats. So they balance about at um, nil. LO, I actually don't know what that stadium is like at Leichhardt Oval, duh, of course, because it's got to be a West Tigers home game. Yes, it is. So he scores 77 when he plays at Leichhardt. You know, uh, to me, that means absolutely nothing because Jamal played for the um, played for a couple of teams. He played for Penrith, he played for the Bulldogs. He would have been playing the Tigers, and when he went to play the Tigers, he ended up scoring, you know, 77 as an average. That's pretty woeful to be basing it off like, oh my god, I'm going to be trading in Jamal just because he gets 77 points in the next round. That's not going to be the case. Let's have a scroll down and see if we can see anyone else who kind of sticks out. Kurt Baptiste, he scores 52 when he plays at... Um, he's going to be playing Brisbane, isn't he? Which is that stadium. doesn't matter what the stadium name is. You know what the stadium name is. But is Kurt Baptiste $141,000 worth bringing him in for the round? No, because, well, ultimately, he's going to be out next round anyway. I don't mind doing players against certain other players like for example we just mentioned Sully going up against Jordan Rapana and Joseph Leilua will he get a lot of tackle buffs probably not but saying he's going to a particular venue and not going to do well is a little bit far-fetched for my liking maybe some teams there's a correlation between teams doing well at away or home games but even then it's a little bit you know, hey how are you going opposition this tells you the averages at particular, when they play particular teams, whether they're home or away. So James Graham has the best average of 64.83 when he versus the Manly Sea Eagles. Then he goes back down to 52 when he plays Brisbane and the 46 or 47 rounded up when he plays the Knights. Again, you know, teams change. That's the reality. And some players change teams and then they play that team that they've, they're basing the stats off. And that's a little bit far-fetched from my liking. Like, look at this. Jazz Tavaga is 58 points against St. George Illawarra. And that would have been based off, well, last time he played St. George, he scored 58. Jack Littlejohn, 57. He's on the extended bench and probably won't get any game time. So that doesn't really do much for us. Value predictor. Value predictor uh, you know, is pretty good. I like the value predictor. It's, it's like when you click on them, you can see it has all three. It has the break-even predicted uh, price change so what you're looking at here is the break even 64 if Cameron Smith gets 65 which he's projected to do based on you know accumulation of different stats like venue opposition consistency etc he's going to go up a thousand bucks Cameron McInnes if he scores break even of you know if he scores 61 with a break even of 39 he goes up another 16,000 great news for Cameron McInnes owners once he scores 61 his break-even for round five is going to be 60. Then he's projected to score 48 points, which then he goes down by 189. That's well, That's actually, this is pretty useful stuff to know because you can see the lops and downs of what a player can do. And although the projected scores isn't something to really go off, it kind of gives you a taste of what to expect. So that's why you can kind of tell when you click on someone like a Clint Gutherson. Break even 17, 48 points. That's very likely. If he gets 48 points, 24K. If he gets the 48 points, he then goes and scores 38 the next round, 6K. So it's actually a pretty good projectile to go off. I actually think that's pretty useful. And it's got a, it's got a, it's pretty well done in that it's one user face now. It, I don't think it was always one user face, but now that it is one user face, it, it helps quite a lot. Projected scores, I don't think you can really go off. You know, Jason Tomalolo, 0-50-50. 33.3 I, I don't there's way too many variables and those variables go back to the venues and oppositions consistency scoring you know uh, 73 this is all based off the last three games so Russell Packer let's have a look at his game log he scores 37 43 34 which puts him at an average of about 38 yeah there you go 38 so his consistency rating is 71 all that's telling you is that he's, you know, he's there. It, it's the guys who are scoring where they need to be, not necessarily scoring well, but, you know, guys who are scoring where they need to be. 
Let's have a look at the other end of the spectrum. All these guys haven't played, so there's zero. Is the only one that we can see? One. Drew Hutchison. Anthony Milford. Perfect. So, Milford scores 77. Then he scores seven the following week. His consistency is one. You know, that to me isn't that great of a stat to know. I'm trying to pull meaning from numbers here, and it's a little bit far-fetched. Coach's choice is interesting because it kind of tells you where everyone else's head's thinking. One thing to note is just because one person does it or two people do it or three or four or five or half the league does it doesn't necessarily mean that it's a good choice. You should always look at the bigger picture and do your own research. I say this all the time. While I can give you advice or while someone else on the internet can give you advice, always do your own research. This is basically like the stock market. You, you got to treat the players as if they're shares and you're trying to buy them where, at a ripened price and then sell them when they've, you know, after they've paid the dividends or after they've given you good capital growth or when you know that they're going to start to go down because gold, for example, if you invested in gold, you know, you think the uh, election of President Donald Trump is going to bring down the price of gold, which it did. So, you know, those, those are things to consider, but there's a... You know, there's a lot of choices here. If you look at that, Roger Tulasek, Jamal Idris, Jaden Braley, and look at that, Jamal Idris, perfect example. 44,000 people have him. He hasn't played. He hasn't played last game, and he hasn't been named this week. Does that mean we should buy him? No. Form? What is form going to tell us? The last three averages. Well, you guys have that stat. It tells you, last average, 67.3. And this is basically telling us the top scorers. So that doesn't really do much for us. Um, average projected score over the last three rounds versus the average. Okay, so it's basically, it's what their average was versus the discrepancy of the average. Now let's have a look at this. The highest ones, well, that's not even going to be a case because those two guys aren't even playing. But it's saying it's a discrepancy of 21 points between what they what the system projected and what he actually you know scored. Felice Cafusi is a perfect example. He's projected at 22 points, scores 43 consistently because he's actually a starting second roller, and he's actually quite good at his outputs, attacking base stats, and also tackles and not missing tackles. So, is it worth buying? One more thing I will show you is the top 10 list. So this is. Basically showing the top 10 players at the moment. Who has what and why. Well, it doesn't tell you why, but who has what. Most popular captain's choices obviously looks a little bit broken because Chris Gerismal and Seguiaro are now added in there, so they're one and two. But it's really Cameron Smith, Andrew Feeder, Jack DeBellin, Jonathan Thurston. Most popular reserves, I think, are very... It, it, this doesn't help you at all. Because... It says Cameron Smith is the most popular reserve, but you can have Cameron Smith playing in your main team and then not have him as a reserve, or then you can swap him out and have Braley as your starting hooker. It doesn't change the fact what they score is what you get, unless, you know, you captain Cameron Smith and therefore you can't reserve him. That's that's, I think that's a really silly kind of stat to have, when I, but it's in there. Most popular mid-range, mid-range price players, which is going to be probably 200 to 300k, saying Roger, Jaden, Elgie, Kotrick, Yates... Again, probably not a stat that's that great. I don't believe in mid-ranges anyway, and that's not really mid-range. Mid-range for me is more like 300 to, or 250 to 400, in my opinion. Biggest price drops of the week. Um, This is okay data. This isn't too bad. This just tells us who's losing the most amount of cash or who can we keep an eye out for, and there's a lot of players here. Robbie Rocco, Joseph Leilua, Sean Kenny Dow, Jesse Bromwich, Nightingale, Elliot Whitehead. So... That does help you to a degree because you like you want to buy them when they bottom out if you think they're definitely going to be going up to their regular average, which, you know, for example, Elliot Whitehead's a perfect example because he's been playing centers and now he's going back to the second row. Jesse Bromwich, you know, broke his finger in the first round, scored seven, then got 37 in the last round. We expect him to go back up to his usual scoring of 40, 50s, etc. Weekly price rises... Uh, this is more about showboats than anything. Everyone that had Colin Hess, good on you for having him. Jaden Braley, Andrew McCullough, Clinton Guth, Felice, Paul Vaughan, wasn't he impressive just on uh, Sunday night? Riley Jacks, Alex Johnson, Kotrick, price drops for the season. 
this is again a, a pretty good tr stat to have because you're looking at the guys who you want to potentially pick up Bertie and Thompson someone good that you can also have season price rises this is wrong because Braden Burns and Isaiah Papali what I know fan up have a look at that most traded in players we look at this we looked at this last week and we pointed out a lot of people who would bring in players because they scored really well one round let's perfect example Luke Keary scored 70 first round second round 30 th um, second, third round was like 7 it was abysmal and everyone's like well I traded him because you know he was going to be the new Roosters half or whatever he's going to pick up his game I, I picked him up because he for one round that's crap that's absolute garbage you shouldn't be doing that most traded out players Curtis Siren and Jared Hayne Mitchell Moses Kane Elgi Jordan Kehu I don't even know why he had Kehu in the first place that's that's really strange but Moses Sully Robbie Farrar I'm surprised Farrar was in there given that they had bench hookers on their actual lineups each week but um is it worth buying now I buy it because I like to support fan hub I like to support the game I want to make sure it keeps running I know that they probably don't need my money to use it but I actually find it pretty useful just for those little trait things that you can kind of do the other thing that you can kind of do here is just click on the buy detector which is um you have 13 players on this buy round and it shows you which players are out by blocking out there by having like a, a color coordinated block out you can see it says around 13 16. now you could put that all into a spreadsheet and in fact there are many other groups out there fantasy groups which again i'm going to talk about next week which have different sheets of data like your break evens and they bring it out each week that you can that you can easily access like it's not hard to find but for me, I, I, it, it's simple, it's easy. I can look at the NRL Fantasy Coach just like that. And that's really the only tab I'll ever hit. The only reason why I look at the top 10 list is just to illustrate people making bogus trades because of a one-week good score or a one-week poor score and kicking out someone like a Bryce Cartwright because he didn't do well in one round or he got injured. So um, I only look at this. I only look at NRL Fantasy Coach. 20 bucks, you know, isn't that big of a, of a leap of faith. I do it because I like to support the people behind the program, and um, it it does it does come in pretty handy at times. Like the only two things I'm looking for is break evens, projected you know price change. So for me, will will I be buying the NRL fantasy coach next year? Yes. Did I buy it last year? Yes. Did I buy it the year before? Yes. So it all comes down to preference and, and what you're comfortable with. Maybe you're a little bit younger. Maybe you don't have the funds to kind of spare up. So you really got to weigh up the pros and cons here and, and say, does it work for you? And if it does, by all means, definitely go out and buy it. The break-even tool is great to have because, you know, you can kind of determine when you need to sell players and when it's right to buy players. First question of the night comes from Multiple Scorgasms and he asks, what are Munster owners to do? And he says for himself, Jack's proving himself a solid reserve option so don't necessarily have to replace him with another scoring half. Is it worth downgrading him to someone like Stimson to start building a war chest for the likes of Birding Thompson, Elliot Whitehead, Jesse Bromwich, who are bottoming out in the price soon? Or are we better off chasing points and grabbing a scorer that preferably plays in round 12? What about potentially grabbing Jesse Bromwich a week early despite have, despite him still having cash to lose and a high break even for next week. So that's actually a really, really, really good question. From that question, I can gather that Munster is currently being played in the halves. So that was what was implied by Jack's proving himself a solid reserve option. So he's going to be trading out Cameron Munster from his halves onto the bench and bringing in Riley Jacks to kind of fill in. Now, the only problem I have here is, is that Riley Jacks is not the dominant half of the two between him and Cooper Cronk. Despite the fact that Jax actually outscored Kronk this week, it's probably not likely to continue to happen. You've got to remember Kronk's probably the more dominant half in the fact that he's going to be getting the kicking meters where Riley Jax might not necessarily be doing it. That's not to say Riley Jax will not score well. In fact, he probably could have scored 40 plus had he played the full 80 minutes. He only played 48 minutes and scored 37, thanks to a try that he got with a Cameron Smith assist from dummy half. But... Here's my thing is, you're going to put Cameron Munster on the sideline for four to six weeks. Four to six weeks. That's pretty big. Given the fact that he's $436,000, that's a lot of money to have on the side. Having money on the side and not playing is the same as having a remaining salary cap of four to $500,000 and doing nothing with it. 
You've got to remember the coaches that are doing well have all or most of their money spread across their players and teams and they're the guys who are accumulating the most amount of points because you generally have to pay the premium price in order to get a genuine scorer. So my first concern there is, well, if you are going to have Riley Jacks, you're going to be missing out each week on, say, to have a Corey Norman who's going to be getting the 40s and 50s. So you're leaking at about 4, 5, up to 20 points potentially each week from a main scorer. And you've got to admit, after 4 to 5, 6 weeks, that kind of adds up. If there was a big of a gap that it's going to be about 15 points on average each week for 5 weeks, you're easily looking at about 70, 80 points there over that duration. And that's the difference between you know getting at the end of the season and being short of someone by 1 or 2 points, let alone 80. So that's one thing to consider. The second part of that question is, is it worth downgrading him to someone like Stimson? Joe Stimson is $145,000. He's probably not going to get much more game time. In fact, he'll be lucky to play for the rest of the season pending injuries. You've got to remember, Tommy Raris is actually coming back around eight or nine. So that means Joey Stimson's probably going to be knocked off the extended bench, not even named in the top 21 people. I don't think that's a good idea. I think you should be trading a gun indefinitely in for a gun when you're doing those trades unless you can do it by one single trade like for example if you have a dual position player like Bryce Cartwright in your second row and you can pull in you know um, Elliot Whitehead knock out Bryce Cartwright down to the halves and then therefore knock out Munster that way that is a pretty good trade but when you're doing trades like I'm going to be pulling in a Joe Stimson or I'm going to be pulling in someone like I don't know, someone who's necessarily not playing like a Jamal Idris in order to free up that money. It's not a good move. You need to be making cash. So you're either looking at cashies or kind of guns at the moment. And it's a particular hard case in the house because all the cashies have kind of already shot off. And if you're looking at making the most out of that money that you've got, you can't really trade down to Riley Jacks because the boat is sailing. It hasn't potentially sailed all the way yet. He still has a significant amount of money to go. And you already mentioned that you've got him. But looking at Riley Jacks, this is for the other people, of course, his break-even is negative one. If he scores 33, and then he scores 33 again, and then 33 again, the, pro the projected price change is ridiculous. It's like an extra 60K, 50, 60K right there for you guys. Pending, you know, he could go big, he could get like a 40, he could go down and get like a 20, but he's going to be making money anyway. There's no one really to trade down your halves until in the moment. And that's the other thing you have to consider. Do I want to trade a monster down to someone like a Jai Field who's not going to be playing? I wouldn't be doing that. That's just a wasted bench spot. You can do that later on in the season, like around 15, around 16. What you want to do is you want to make sure that you have non-playing reserves that aren't scoring. Just in case one of your players goes down, like for example, if a James Graham gets injured during the game, or for example, he gets pulled last minute and I didn't have enough time to change him, I then get an auto emergency and it goes down from the non-playing reserves, the lowest scoring non-playing reserve. And if it's someone like Braden Burns who doesn't play this week, his score doesn't get counted. It goes up to the next lowest scoring player who actually played. So it's not worth doing that just yet. I do agree that it's started, you've got to start building that war chest of those guys, but we're going to, we will touch base on that in just a moment. This question in particular comes from Dreamers, which touches upon the last question. He says, wait one more week on Whitehead and hope he drops another 10 to 15k or jump him this week and get a head start on the pack. This is completely dependent upon where your team is at. Do you need to score points? Is the player that you're going to be pulling Whitehead in for going to be scoring that significantly different? Like for example... I'm going to look to trade out Zane Musgrove. If I'm looking out to trade out Zane Musgrove, I'm expecting him to get 25, 30, maybe. With Whitehead, I'm expecting 40 to 50. It's an extra 20 points. But do I need the cash? Do I ultimately need the cash right now? And for me, I don't need to make that trade. Elliot Whitehead's break-even is 63. In 2016, when he plays 80 minutes in the second row, he only exceeded 63 or above five times out of 26 rounds which tells me he's still got a little bit of cash to lose. And the other thing that you've got to be worried about, specifically with Elliot Whitehead, is if a center gets injured, it looks like he's going to be pushed into the center role, much like Shoni Matautia. But I'm not too concerned about that in particular. That is another different argument, and I don't think you should be really considering that as a factor. I think you should be trying to sell and buy players at the optimum price. 
Because how many times, let's say that you've got enough money. I've got enough money to go to Elliot Whitehead right now. I've got 194K. I could trade Zane Musgrove to Elliot Whitehead right now. Wouldn't it be a drama? I'd have excess money. But after that trade, how many times have you tried to make a trade between one player and another player but been short by 5K or 10K? How painful would it be if you couldn't make one trade in particular because you didn't have 1K of money? And that's going to be the difference between you know, picking up a player and not necessarily picking up a player. The guys who I'm looking at trading, Zane Musgrove and Curtis Sirenen, all are in the same ballpark where they've got relative high break-evens in relation to their average, but they still have a little bit more money to make, and Whitehead has a little bit money to lose. So if Whitehead loses 10k this round, and for example, Zane Musgrove gains 5 grand in the next round, I'm up 15 grand in total there. That's 15 grand that I wish I would have had further down the track. So... I think it for me, unless you're in a really big tight, you know, you're in a real tight spot, you're cornered against the corner, you desperately need to score points, and you're worried about having one particular player and they're scoring, or maybe it was a starting player and now they're going to the bench, you're like, shit, they're not going to score as well. Yes, bring him in, but realize that there's like a 15K or the potential money down and upside that you're going to be missing out on. For me, I'm particularly looking at trading out Zane Musgrove and also Curtis Sirenen. A lot of people have pulled that card of Curtis Sirenen. Do we want to trade him out? I, for me in particular, the answer is no. If you had a look at the bench for this week for the Manly team, let's have a quick look at it right now. I actually had it up because I was looking at it just a minute ago. Lewis Brown is named Utility. He plays like hooker, center, and a little bit of second row and fills in for like a 10-minute gap. Nate Miles goes in for prop. Jackson Hastings is another utility, like a fullback, center half. Doesn't necessarily play in the second row. AFB, again, is another prop. What does that tell you right now? That Frankie Winnerstein and Kerry Sirenen are going to be playing that 70 to 80 minutes again. So they're for those two guys in particular, they're not going to be trades. And the reason why is I looked at last year's stats, and when Curtis Sirenen plays 70 or more minutes last year, he averages about 39 to 40 points. And that includes the season before where he also does the same. What hurt him this round is that he did a lot of stupid mistakes, a lot of errors, a lot of penalties, a couple of missed tackles, and he had a bit of a misdemeanor. Now, I want to trade out Curtis Sirenen. If you have a look at his buy, his the way his buys are, he, he doesn't play 12 or round 15, which is the big buy rounds that I need players playing. He's definitely a trade, but I'm going to be holding on to him. Again, it's that potential upside between so Curtis Sirenen hitting a 35, going up another 5k, and then Elliot Whitehead losing 10k, getting that 15k, and you know clicking my hands together. The one player I'm looking at potentially moving out is Zane Musgrove. Again, it's, it's all circumstantial. I unreserved him one minute before the game because I found that George Burgess had been named at starting prop when Zane Musgrove had been moved to the bench. Zane Musgrove came on, you know, scored 25 points, whatever. He's a starter. When you play him off the bench, he just doesn't wake up. He's not an impact player. He's not like a fooey fooey moi moi. And the same things happened this week. I was really excited to hear that George Burgess got suspended because I was like, well, that's good news for Zane Musgrove. He'll go back to starting. But Zane Musgrove yet again ended up getting screwed over where his brother, Tom Burgess, George Burgess's brother, I should say, ended up get, getting named at the number eight position for starting prop. So I'm expecting not that great of a score out of Zane Musgrove. And I think he's hit his peak he might do better than 24 this round i'd be surprised if he did but i'm considering bringing elliot whitehead because i think whitehead's good for 40 i think musgrove's good for 25 15 points because i've dropped a fair amount of ranks i'm really considering bringing him in the other option i'm also doing is a bit of an advanced trade and i'm getting completely artistic with this trade i'm thinking about bringing in uh, Ponga for Musgrove. I'd bring in Ponga. I'd pull it. Uh, I'd pu pull him into the fullback position. Push Nick Kotrick up to Shoney Matautia. Push Shoney Matautia up to uh, Joshy Maguire. Push Shoney Joshy Maguire up into the front row, and that way do like an advanced five or six way trade in order to do it. Sometimes you have to look a little bit outside the box. I had someone earlier in the week tell me I want you know Tyrone Roberts Davis. What do I do? And I was like, he only showed me his fullbacks. And then I had a look at his centers, and his centers were like, well, you can move Kotrick up and bump out Jamal Idris because he was like, I need to get rid of Jamal Idris as well. And that's some of the things you guys have to look at at advanced trades. In fact, I might do one right now just to show you guys how it's done. I'm sure a lot of you know how to do it, but there's still the odd question or two 
how to particularly make it work. So, player to trade out, Zane Musgrove, bang. I'm going to hit the S for Joshua Maguire, fill in that position. Uh, Shoni Matauti goes up. In comes Nick Kotrick, and then where am I going to be looking? Where's Ponga? Ponga, 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 Ponga. Now, this isn't a definite trade for me. I will talk about this trade in a minute. But it's given me $291,000. That's so much money. That is so much money. Well, let's have a look at this trade in particular. So, Ponga, last round I wasn't that enthused about him because I was like, he's only going to play two rounds. Kyle Felt gets injured last week. Kyle Felt's now pushed from centers into wing for Jarvid Bowen. That tells me that Kyle Felt is still injured and likely to be pushed out of the squad even further if that's the case. He, I don't I don't quite get that movement because you, you've had Bowen on the wing the whole time. So they're really trying to pull up this, this utility back line where they're going to be playing an injured player, which is a high-risk situation for the Cowboys, especially for Felt. So I feel like Pongham might actually play more than two games. And look at his break-even analysis. Let's have a look at the projected income fantasy coach. 29 points, 20K. 29 points the next round, another 21K. 29 points around after, another 17k. There's like 60k there. And that's, you know, if he scores better than 29, you imagine what the figures are. If he gets another 38, another 38. He's just so dangerous. He gets the ball, he starts to run around, he darts around, he's fast. He's He might be a little bit small, but he, he's hard to tackle. He's like Roger Tulvasashek or even uh, one of the old um, Peachy Boys or, or Preston Campbell. You know, he's a hard guy to tackle and he just rubs them off and gets those tackle bust attacking stats. So that's one way I'm also looking at it, but I'm not quite sure just yet. So don't put me on the wire if I do a last minute swap. I also, that also means if I pull in Ponga, I'm going to definitely have to play four cheapies, four cheapy centers. And that is my next question from Random. What to do all about all the low scoring cash cow WFBs and centers, particularly if you have four cheapy centers. And let me throw this question back at you. If you were playing draft mode, if you were playing draft mode, that was. Draft mode is where you effectively build your team and everyone else is trying to build their team and you take turns in building a team like you, if the first player picks his first player, the second player picks his second player. Guess what position always gets filled in last? That's correct. It's the center position. Everyone usually builds up the hooker. They put in Cameron Smith, McInnes, McCulloch. They put in the front row. Your James Graham, your Sammy Burgess, if he was playing front row still. Your second row. And then they start to look at your halves and fullbacks. And your centers are always last because your centers are always inconsistent as well as your wingers. They're the most inconsistent position between the two of them. And that's why I don't put a lot of money in there in the first place. You've got to think about, let's have a look at the guy who, who costs the most amount at the start of the year. A Joseph Le Lua, $465,000 or $464,000 at the start of the year. How many people own him? 7% of people own him. He's averaging 28.3, and that's because he's just not getting a lot of ball at the moment. And that's just the way that the center position works. He goes up one one week, he goes down the next week, up next week, then has an average round. You know, a, a quiet one week because the ball's not spread out his side. I don't care about that position as much, and that's why I'm happy to have cheapy centers because they're generally going to be scoring more points in their break-evens and getting me dollar values. And that's the other reason why I love to play Shoni Metallier in the centers because a second row scoring as a center is going to be, <coughs> excuse me, well, is going to be is going to be uh, is going to be way more consistent than having a center there. Sully, look at this guy. Sully scores 52, 28, and 10. Like I said, he, he played against you know Lapana on that side of the field last game against the Raiders. Couldn't do anything about it. Scored 10. Predicted it. He scored 52 against the Rabbitohs against an injured. Uh, Greg Inglis. That's probably not more likely his score. He's more about a 28, 20 point scorer in my opinion on an average. We'll see that in the long run once he starts, once we get more games out of through. But his break even is 15. I still think there's a little bit more cash to make. Brian Kelly is the same situation. Break even of eight. Kotrick's another case of that. Break even of zero. Talakai, I'm actually going to be playing in Talakai for Sully. I think Talakai is great. He's got a break-even of three. Abby, you know, disappointing break-even of 13. I, and that's the other thing. If they don't live up to your guys' hype in the first round, don't get turned away from uh, in the first go. Brayden Burns was another case. He scored me 10 points in the first round. Then ended up scoring 28 points in the following round. He ended up getting 4K up, and now his break-even is seven. 
So that's all it takes. When the centers and the wing fullbacks are that low, and you're like, well, Tyron Roberts Davis scored 10 points. That's crap. His break even is still eight. He's still got quite a bit of money to make. The only thing you've got to be no, you know, mindful of the fact is they're not going to be scoring much better than you know your Jared Croakers, your really expensive guys who are going to be scoring up there consistent, consistently. So my advice on that question is hold in tight, live with the reality that they're not going to be scoring well, reap the rewards. Fantasy is like chess. It's the long-term play. It's a long-term game where you're playing to put yourself in the best position for the second half of the season. It was great that I got 22nd in my first week. Was it likely to happen the following week? Not really. And that's okay because I don't have all my money spent. I've got $198,000 before this round in order to spend, whereas a lot of other people have thrown all their money on the field. So it's two completely different trains of thought. The upside here is I can trade any of my players right now into Elliot Whitehead from the second row, the Winnersteins, the Syrians, and, the, and, and um, who did I have there before? Zane Musgrove. So that's why I kind of did it, and I didn't want to definitely spend my money on a, on a particular play I wasn't overly wrapped with. Remember, I'm just a gun or cashy type of guy, so I'm going to be trading it to a, a cashy to a gun very shortly. So that's my kind of thinking along those lines. Just just deal with it for now. It kind of sucks, and you're kind of playing a little bit of ping pong. Try to work out for yourself who's going to be scoring the most amount of points that week. Who are they playing? Are they going to be out of position? Who's playing the Raiders this week? I definitely wouldn't be playing them. It's Brisbane, so Jordan K, who might struggle against, you know, Lapana on their edge, if that's the edge that they're going to be up against. So be a little bit worried if it's Corey Oates, they're probably not going to score as well. So that should answer your question there. Put all your money where you're consistently going to get the right points. Question that was left just on my last YouTube video from round number three from Kyle Thorn. I hope I pronounced that correctly. What should I do? I have 100, 371k and I want to go get a good forward reserve. Now, that's a bit of a red flag for me. If you have 371k, I mean, I thought having 198k was bad, but if you have 371k, sitting in your remaining salary unspent, you need to spend it before the next round because that's a gun. That's a cashy to a gun. If, if you've got like a base plate at 138 and you add 371K, you've got a $500,000 gun. Like you need to have that money spent because the money spent not necessarily having a gun is someone else having that money spent on a gun and therefore scoring much better than you at least statistically wise, like the probability of a James Graham outscoring a Tyrone Roberts. Will it happen this round? Most likely. Tyrone Roberts could outscore the other guy, but who would you look at picking up? I mean, there's so many options to look at at the moment. I think Jesse Bromwich is definitely a goer, but the only thing there is he's break even 71, so potentially wait a round or two. There's other guys that you can look at that I particularly have. I mean, Andrew Fafita. He's got 71 as a break even. He can get 71. So I'd even look at bringing in Andrew Fafita. And I'm sure you've got the player and the money to be able to do that if you've got 371k on hold. The other considerations are the guys I have. Joshua Maguire. I mean, Ryan James should get it back up to that scoring habit soon enough. And it looks like he's scoring consistently 55, 48, 52. And he's starting to go down a little bit of value. Or if you've got like a second row position, like you've got a front row forward who, or a second row, who you could push down. Like if you've got Josh McGuire in your front row and you could push down in your second row, you could, or the other way around, where you want to put in a second row for a forward, there's a lot of options there from Jack DeBell. I definitely think get Jack DeBellin. Like Jack DeBellin's one of those guys who's going to be consistently scoring well. He's a defensive, he's like Thor. Nothing gets through him. Even if it's the odd tackle bust, you know, that, that a player gets against him, he makes up for it with attacking stats regardless. Simon Mannering looks pretty hefty to have because he got off to a bad start. He's another one where his break-even is 58, which he's likely to get. So he's another one to kind of grab. I'd look at players who you know are going to be playing at that round 12 in the first buy round. So Sammy Burgess, uh, James Graham, who don't have origin duties because they're Englishmen. Who's another option? I mean, you can even look at uh, Trevojevic, but he plays round 12 and 15. Josh Papali would also be another great move. There's so many different ways to think about it that I don't want to pinpoint anyone in, on you particularly, but Mannering looks pretty tasty at, you know, just 100, 510, 
but Jesse Bromwich potentially another round after. But there's so many good options out there. Just kind of weigh it up. Go with your gut a little bit. Do your research. When you make your decision, know why you've made your decision. Don't just go with the flow and be like, I'm making a decision because I told you to do it or someone else said it was a good idea. Do your research, understand why they're scoring well and have a look at their stat breakdowns. Did they score a try last week? Is that why they've got a much higher score than what they usually have and, and kind of base it off that. And lastly, guys, this is my favorite segment of the show. Can we catch the first place guy or the guy coming first in NRL fantasy by the end of the season? It is indeed Renegade Black. His coach name is M Black which is like Man in Black. If the if his middle name was like I, it started with I, like maybe Ian, M-I-B, Man in Black, I like it. He's got 200, well, 2,515 points. See, he's only like 260 points ahead of us. That's not that big of a deal, guys. You can make that up during the buy program. All you guys that are below around my 3,000 rank, don't be too concerned. If you're around 5,000, 10,000, it's still doable. If you're about 30 to 40,000, you still have a lot to learn. Keep going through. Keep trying different things. You might have to change your strategy a little bit to try to catch up, particularly pick some players that are going to be pods. Pods are point players of difference or points of difference. Guys who don't have a lot of coaches owning them, like, let's have a look at this particular team. Brock Lamb is owned. That's not a pod because he's got more than 10% ownership. Gutherson, he's got less than 10% ownership, so he can be considered a pod. A pod, you know, someone who's going to be scoring more points for you rather than other teams. If you have someone like a Kotrick, he scores really well, gets 60. 50% of owners do anyway, so that you're not going to be gaining much there. But if you've got Gutherson at less than 10% and he gets 70, like you did for these other coaches, great result. Let's have a look at uh, Mitchell Black, Renegade Black's team. Cameron Smith, very solid. Jaden Braley is probably the best cashy hooker that you could have grabbed. Good on you for doing that. Joshua Maguire, Jared Wallace, how many times is this guy going to get lucky? Cohen S is in the same bracket. Jared Wallace played three games this season, and he looked to be scoring an abysmal 25, 30, maybe 40 points if he was lucky. And every time players on his team have gotten injured, so he's played an increased amount of minutes than what was originally planned. So he shouldn't be averaging 47. He's just been lucky. You guys that bought him picked him up early. Good on you. You took a bit of a pump with him, and he's done you the deed. He's done the job well. Very unfortunate for the people who don't have him. On his reserve bench, he's got Isaiah Papali, who only played the one game. I think it was round one. Yep, it was. Came off the bench. He probably won't get much more game time. Sammy Burgess, Mitch Barnett, very solid second row. Shown him a touty. I'm surprised he's not in his centers. But what he's opted here for is, is to have four cheapy centers. And he's he's got the same philosophy. You know, cheapy centers makes you the cash. Inconsistency, rather than putting it up here, where you're a little bit worried about their scores. He has Luke Yates, who is probably the best second-row cashier there is. Sean Johnson's been scoring well. He's up to $530,000. Lamb has doing, been doing a good job, punching above his weight, still going up money. Has a considerable amount of money to still make as well. Kane Elgie, Jai Field is probably just a little bit of a weakness. That's the same centers that I look to have for this next round. Gutherson, Braden Burns... Wow, okay. So what this meant for him in this last round, because Burns, well, Burns did score 28 points, he's got Jared Hayne and Roger Torvastashek on the sidelines. So he's happy to have only the a couple of caches while these guys, while Jared Hayne sits out for four to six rounds. Fair call. Jared Hayne might come back after, you know, a couple of rounds earlier, but he's holding on to him on the fact that he might be able to muscle up or maybe it was a trade he couldn't make. Maybe he had to bring in Cohen Hess around earlier. This is actually a very solid team, and I wouldn't be surprised if he continually pushed away from everyone. He's got to have quite a few unlucky breaks go his way for everyone else to try to catch up. So we'll have to see how that plays out. Can we catch him? I'm going to say yes. I mean, who can't we catch? Maybe he doesn't have a good squad for state of origin, you know, coverage, but we'll look at that in a couple of more rounds. Probably around 7 or 8. That's when you really got to start to worry about that after your caches have kind of made their cash and made their own way. But this has been a Spot the Aussie video, guys. Your yeah, NRL Fantasy today. I hope you've enjoyed it. Be sure to hit that subscribe button. Keep showing me and keep asking me your questions. I will put them on here for the video. I hope this has been helpful. Next week, we're going to be looking at social media news. So we'll have a look at all the different groups, the forums, the NRL Reddit, and we'll go from there. Thanks for tuning in, guys, and I'll check you guys out shortly.